So we're still in the concept of infection and we are going to talk about different uh, things with the respiratory system and some others and one is pneumonia and influenza. But one of the things I want to do is just, I put this up for ventilation, just kind of review, just remember the process of breathing air into and out of the lungs are affected by our intercostal muscles, diaphragm, and ribs. When we take a breath in, our rib cage will move out, right? And as we exhale, it moves back into normal. That has a squeeze on everything. It helps us remove air. These, It's a, all the muscles that are involved in here. So if we have a damage or trauma to anything, we can cause ventilation interruption, right? Broken ribs, anything like that. The brain, our brain is, is what says, hey, we need to breathe automatically. We don't think about breathing. It automatically is a part of us that, um, so we, we, our brain has to be intact, especially the lower part um, is the basic for respirations and um, our heart to beat and all that good stuff. Chemoreceptors. If we have a change in oxygen or CO2 throughout the body, it's going to trigger us to either, it's going to send signal to um, the aorta, the spinal, um, spinal fluid, to the spinal nerves to say, hey, we need to do something here. Something's going on. We've got to survive. And so if we have a decrease or an increase in oxygen or CO2, depending on what's going on, then this can interrupt or affect our ventilation just FYI, just kind of explaining it so that as we talk about things, if it interrupts it, you understand that we're having a ventilation issue and that's not good. So this is not one of our exemplars, but I did add it in because nasopharyngitis is the common cold. It's an upper respiratory infection. We see it a lot in kids. We see it in a lot in adults. Um, so I just wanted to add it so that you just kind of have, you understand that's the name of that. So that's what we're looking at. It can um, lead to worse things like bronchitis, pneumonitis, and ear infections. And so it kind of connects with otitis media. So I wanted to put it on in there just so that you can see, well, nasal discharge, irritability, sore throat, cough, and general discomfort. We've all had the cold. So nasopharyngitis is, um, we're continuing on with that, and we see allergic rhinitis. Well, I just want to go on record that it's not the same as the cold, as a cold. Um, this is also considered hay fever, if you've ever heard of that. It's an allergic reaction. We have um, the uh, child will not have a fever, purulent nasal discharge, the red mucous membranes, all the watery, itchy eyes. It's just not a very comfortable thing. So I just want to make sure that these things you understand are there. I don't necessarily think you'll be tested on those for the test that's coming up for my students, but I will say this is actually knowing that is a great thing to understand. So you'll see it somewhere in your practice, I'm sure. So acute pharyngitis is another thing that is not one of our exemplars, but I did want to just kind of touch base with it. Um, it's inflammation of the structures of the throat. So if you think about it, we've talked about otitis media. We're talking about um, different things that create issues with, um, uh, and that can cause other infections and stuff like that. So I wanted to kind of, to just go through this. If this is inflammation of structures of the throat, it's common in children five to 10 years of age. Um, Virus is the most common cause of it, so it's a viral um, influence. And I wanted just to go ahead, now I will butcher this, but um, this right here, I'm not even gonna say it, I'm gonna just kind of circle it there. That is not the flu. That is not what we're talking about is the flu. So I wanted you to see this is um, something that's not the flu, but it is a bacteria that can is the most common um, in children younger than three years, this is what we see that causes acute pharyngitis. Symptoms are fever, malaise, dysphagia, and anorexia. They don't want to eat conjunctivitis. We just talked about that, didn't we? Rhinitis, cough, hoarseness with gradual onset, and lasts no longer than five days. Um, it is in children older than two. Um, streptococcal pharyngitis may include a fever of 104. So when we start to get um, strep involved, streptococcal infections, we're going to see those higher temperatures. So what would we want to do? Give an antipyretic, which is acetaminophen or Tylenol, 
as directed based on the children's age and weight. Um, and it may require antibiotics um, if it is a bacterial, um, if it's bacterial and not viral, we might end up having to have antibiotics given. So sinusitis in children, I, we teach across the lifespan, so it's kind of interesting, and I brought this slide in for a reason. Frontal sinuses are present around eight years of age, but are not fully mature until around age of 18, which I think is interesting. So we're seeing a difference in the child and the adult, or the young adult, right? We're 18, we're considered a young adult. Um, Proximity of the sinus to the tooth roots often results in tooth pain when a sinus infection, sinus infection occurs. So I thought that's kind of interesting too. Have you ever had people say, oh, my teeth just ache or whatever, and it's a sinus infection? That's the reason behind. Maxillary and ethmoid sinuses are most often involved in childhood sinusitis. So if you go back and review your anatomy, you can see where those sinus cavities are and why. Um, suspects uh, sinus infection when a upper respiratory infection lasts longer than 10 days. So we get an upper respiratory infection, which is a URI. If it's going to last more than 10 days, we probably have a sinus infection going on that needs to be treated. So always suspect that. So when you get sick, your child gets sick, if you're talking or teaching to parents, let them know if they're not getting better after 10 days, we need to see them back in the office. If you're at home taking care of your own child, then you know after, after eight to 10 days, I'd be like, something's just not happening, calling the office and getting back in to be seen because we probably have a sinus infection that needs to be treated. Um, it will require antimicrobial therapy. And just so you know, um, we say antibiotics all the time, but antimicrobials, kind of the same thing. That's the amoxicillin, those things. It's um, they are treating different things. They're made from different sources. So that's kind of the difference. So don't get too freaked out about that terminology. Just an FYI. -er. So I want to include croup syndromes. I think it's important so that we understand. Congenital laryngeal strider, and this is due to weakness in the airway walls. They have a, a floppy epiglottis. Um, and it causes strider upon inspiration. It can be very concerning. You can you can be worried sick by hearing this. Um, symptoms usually lessen if we can put them on a prone position. We'll put them on their stomach or prop them in a slide line position. But we definitely want to help support so that it will um, correct or um, help with the weakness of the airway walls and the floppy epiglottis. Um, it usually will clear spontaneously as a child grows and the muscles start to strengthen. And so we definitely want to let the family know that um, just so that that will give them peace of mind. Now, the reason why I add the croup syndromes in, because that is one thing that we have, and that's a growth and development thing. You know what I'm saying? This is strengthening muscle walls, that kind of stuff. But then we have epiglottitis, and um, this is a one bolded because I was an ER nurse and a flight nurse and all that good stuff. It's swelling of tissues above the vocal cords. And when that happens, then we have a narrowing of the airway. And this can cause actual airway obstruction. So we have to be very, very quick and pick up on what we need to do. It's caused by the H influenzae type B. And um, it's often seen in three to six years of age. It can occur at any time, so we're not just seeing it during this time or that time. Um, the course is rapid, progressive, and life-threatening. It comes on very quickly, and we need to move very quickly to open the airway. So this is an airway emergency, and I know that it is not in our exemplars, but I did want to share this with you because I think it's important that you understand and you possibly could see this in the real world. And I would want you to know that this is an emergency. It's an airway emergency, and we need to act very quickly. So um, what we, how we treat um, um, epiglottitis, if uh, we will immediately either do a trach um, or endotracheal intubation um, to get oxygen in to prevent hypoxia because we've narrowed or closing that airway they're not going to breathe if we don't do something pretty quickly they can respiratory arrest so it's very very important um, 
one of the things that we see with this is we're going to see um, the patient, you'll see them, the classic symptoms are, they insist on sitting up, they're gonna lean forward with the mouth open and they drool saliva and have difficulty swallowing. This is all swelling up. They're gonna be wide-eyed and anxious. So I'm gonna tell you, anybody this is based just on my experience. Anybody that is having an airway emergency, they're gonna be wide-eyed and anxious because they know it's impending doom. They know internally something's wrong. They're trying to survive. So you're gonna see that. Um, the cough can be absent. Inspection of the throat shows an large reddened edematous epiglottis. And what it looks like is a big beefy red thumb. So it's just big and swollen in here. You don't see much where anything can really go. Um, but when you are examining a patient that has epiglottitis, one of the things that you want to be very careful is that we don't trigger um, with an actual tongue blade or if we're intubating the patient with the blade for that. Um, it can cause laryngeal spasms. So we can actually have the airway close even tighter based by the examination. So you want to be very careful. This is an, a 911 emergency this is an emergency in-house if you are um, taking care of a, a child that has this this is a airway emergency just an fyi -er. so bronchitis is another one um, this is inflammation of the bronchi um, infection of the bronchi seldom primary infection um, it can be caused by a multitude of microorganisms that's one of the issues with all of these but the big thing for this to tell the difference is they have an unproductive hacking cough. Um, cough suppressants before bedtime so a child can sleep. We want to try to give that so they can rest. You know, if you cough and cough and cough, it's just irritating. It also wears you out physically. So we definitely want to have them rest for healing purposes, and, and we need to help probably suppress the cough. Um, we can give over-the-counter agents such as antihistamines, cough expectorants, and antimicrobial agents are not normally helpful. So we're not going to just throw an antibiotic at them, even though that's what we think we should do. We usually treat them at home based on the over-the-counters, and um, they usually will get better. Now, once again, if the child doesn't get better after a period, after a period of time, they need to follow up with the physician because there is something more going on and they might need that antibiotic then. We talked about RSV in the last class prior to this one um, unit, or week two, I should say. Um, it's responsible for 50% of the cases of bronchiolitis in infants and young children. I brought it back and put this in here because I want you to see and understand that everything is connected. Everything pretty much is connected. So if we are looking at RSV in week two and we're in week four and here we are again with some um, different uh, infections and things that are going on, then I want you to understand that this plays a role in it and we can connect these pieces. So it's spread by direct contact with respiratory secretions. We talked about that. It lives six hours on countertops, tissues, and bars of soap. So that's why kids spread it like wildfire because they, right? And then they touch everything and then they touch everything or they touch each other or they put it in their mouth, you know, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, right? Um, it is spread by direct contact, so these, these um, patients should be on contact isolation. Incubation is approximately four days, and once again, there it is, the contact isolation precautions, because it's not airborne. It's not like they cough and sneeze and, and it goes out into the air and we inhale it and get it. This is a actual contact. They have to, we get it from their secretions, and um, that's how it works. But I wanted to bring that back to you because it is interesting that 50% cases of bronchiolitis are in infants and young children, but we spread it through this RSV. So the next thing we're going to talk about is pneumonia. Um, this actually is taken from Leifer, this slide here. And so we're talking about children. It's inflammation of the lungs in which the alveoli become filled with exudator surfactant um, and surfactant may be reduced. So surfactant is what uh, allows us to um, the pliability of our lungs. It helps us breathe, make move, 
and have the whole oxygen exchange. It's needed. Um, breathing can be shallow, resulting in decreased oxygenated blood. Um, and that's very important to understand. So if we don't have enough oxygen, we're not going to perfuse. We're not going to have tissues that can live, correct? Because we have to have oxygenated tissue. Um, there's bacterial and viral pneumonias. Group B, streptococci, most common cause in newborns. Um, highlight that because it's something to understand. Group B, streptococci is where we can see that, cocci. Um, and newborns and chlamydia, most common cause in infants three weeks to three months old. And I thought that was kind of interesting to know. Now I'm gonna go into a little more detail as I go on with the slides, but I just wanted to cover that really quickly. So if you're taking notes, you can go on through the lecture and then come back and fill in some more blanks there. So once again, pneumonia, it is a severe infection of the lungs. It is causing inflammation of the lungs. What happens is, is the alveoli, um, that's the flute, the sac that's in the lungs and um, the little pocket that's in the lungs. And that is where our gas exchange takes place. That's where CO2 um, goes out and oxygen can go in and oxygen goes out and CO2 comes in. We have this gas exchange that happens. Um, with pneumonia, they can fill with fluids and mucus. And by doing that, if you have a sac that's empty and all of a sudden you fill it up, are you able to get stuff in and out? No, you can't. So we have an impaired gas exchange. And this goes all the way back then a couple weeks where we did um, gas exchange issues, right? And we talked about ABGs and we talked about all that. So we're starting to tie that back into. So with pneumonia, our, those little alveoli are, are affected. They, they start to have this um, fill up. And because of that, we have impaired gas exchange. Our CO2 and our O2 can't do what it needs to do. It can't go in and go out like it should. And when we do that, we're trapping CO2. We're not able to get the CO2 out. And because of that, we can become acidotic, right? Our pH will go down. Our PaCO2 goes above 45, which is opposite. Respiratory is op opposite. Metabolic is equal. And we are in respiratory acidosis. Then that takes us into a whole other realm of signs and symptoms, correct? Correct. Um, also, it can result from inhalation of irritating gases. So we can actually have a chemical burn by inhaling gases and this can and cause damage or um, inflammation to the alveoli, the lungs themselves, and then we can start to have mucus and stuff like that that is created as the byproduct of the injury. And so we end up with pneumonia, just so you know. Um, so pneumonia, there are signs and symptoms. And usually we have a high fever that's accompanied by chills, but I will tell you anything over 100.4 is considered a fever, and that is a sign that we could possibly have pneumonia. So you usually see a fever greater than 100.4. We're not doing that low grade, 99, you know, it's, it's low, but it's not, we start to creep up and it could be a high fever uh, accompanied with chills. Um, a cough that produces rusty or blood flecked sputum. It can be yellow sputum or green sputum also. Um, just it, I'm just going to go on record. This is so not medical, but it's just yucky. It's thick and nasty and ugly. Um, sweating and chest pain is made worse by respiratory movement. And we're going to talk a little more about that. A general feeling of malaise and aching muscles. If you have pneumonia, you can just feel very tired. Um, the diagnosis is confirmed by a chest x-ray, which reveals uh, densities that are in affected lungs. So we see densities on the chest X-ray. We can pull it up and you can have whited out on one side or you can have a little area that's whited out and that's how we know it's pneumonia and that's how we diagnose it. Now I wanna go to back up just a fuzz and look at um, the sweating and chest pain that is made worse by respiratory movement. What happens is, is we have the fever that's greater than 100.4. We'll get some yucky sputum or mucus that we're coughing up. If I'm listening with a stethoscope, they're going to have fine and they're going to have um, coarse crackles. So it's going to sound like a washing machine in there. It's that right that we hear. Um, they're going to be short of breath because they're not making that gas exchange. They're not able to effectively breathe. So they get a little, they have difficulty, shortness of breath, and we note it. Um, but it will worsen. And as it worsens, we can get pleuritic chest pain. 
And this is when, how you know it's pneumonia and not a heart attack, is that we have pain upon inspiration on the breath. So we take a breath in and there's chest pain. But then when we're not breathing in, if we're sitting there, it, we don't have pain. It comes and goes. If it's cardiac, it doesn't matter inspiration or expiration. The pain is there and it will continue. So that's kind of how you know, is it a lung situation or is this a heart problem? If they're having chest pain and upon inspiration, it hurts, there's a stabbing sharp pain, then we know that it's most likely a lung issue. Now you will still always rule out cardiac because you never want to err on the side of it was and you didn't, but we would definitely understand that that is a plural, um, that is a respiratory issue, that pain upon inspiration. So we're looking at pneumonia. Um, if pneumonia worsens, we get a pleuritic chest pain. It's a sharp pain upon inspiration or coughing. It can feel burning for people. Um, and when we listen, we're going to hear a friction rub, a plural friction rub. So if you're listening and you hear a, it, it sounds just like you take paper, uh, sandpaper and goes, it's a friction rub. It's literally friction and it is rubbing. And when you hear that, that is um, a plural friction rub and that's indicative that the pneumonia has worsened and we need to be doing something and getting something going on because, and it goes back up to impaired gas exchange. Pneumonia is there. We have these alveoli. They get full of all this yucky nasty. We can't have our gas exchange, CO2, O2. We're holding on to CO2. We're not oxygenating or perfusing like we should. We become hypoxic. And when we become hypoxic, then we start to have issues. Hypoxia will cause confusion and restlessness. So one of the things that we see is that our patients, if they become restless, agitated, confused, um, they're becoming hypoxic. This is something going on. It's the earliest signs of hypoxia. Put a note in your notes so that maybe not on this test that's coming, guys, but you're not working just for this test. You're working to take care of people and help them and pass your influx too, please. But restlessness, agitation, and confusion are the early onsets of a hypoxia. And what happens is if we have a decrease in pH and an increase in C PaCO2, which is our ABG, correct? We're in respiratory acidosis. This will cause problems with impaired ventilation and we'll have signs and symptoms of altered mental status. We're not oxygenating, we're not getting oxygen to the brain. The goal of everything in our body is to get oxygen to the brain and to the heart so that we can continue to pump and perfuse and that our neurological piece that automatically keeps us breathing and moving and going is present. So it's gonna try to do all those things and um, and based on that, if you came in and your patient was with it and then you walk back in, they have pneumonia and they're just restless, they're agitated, you see, and they don't have to have all three. They could be agitated and restless. It's something, it, it, we see it when people are really starting to have issues with blood pressures, heart rates, and, and respiratory issues. And so for this pneumonia, it's a respiratory piece. We're not perfusing, we're not oxygenating, we're going into hypoxia. The first signs are the early signs are that restlessness, agitation, and you can see confusion. And sometimes guys, confusion can be kind of subtle. So they might be okay, like if you go, can you tell me your name and your date of birth? And they spew that off, but then they can't tell you what they told you this morning that their wife was here and da, 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 or they don't know what day or year it is and they knew what it was earlier. Then those are the things. So always it's important that you engage, really assess your patient. One of the things I really share with my students and I'm sharing now with them is that I want you to go in and really talk to your patient. It's not just, hi, I'm so-and-so and tell me your name and date of birth because people can pull that out pretty quickly or get it out enough to satisfy you and you move on and you're not picking up on those signs and symptoms. So there's a couple other things I do want to talk about on I'm just on this slide for treatment, but I want to talk about nursing and what we're going to do. There's things that we want to do for my students on 298 in your um, 
med search book i want you to go there there's a little nursing management piece it's always good to look at also there's a purple little box that once again brings up what i was talking about that the first signs of hypoxia or low oxygenation is confusion confusion restlessness and agitation and we need to um uh, make sure that we're aware of that so that we're picking up on this so we can act immediately. But in nursing management, we want to promote oxygenation. So how do we do that? One of the things that is good about pneumonia, remember how I talked about the alveoli sacs are full of all that yuck and stuff? It gets sticky and yucky. And the thing of it is, is we've got to get that stuff up and out, right? You just can't give a medicine and it magically goes away. We give a medicine that's going to help prevent more of it from building up and, and help with the body to fight what's happening but to get the stuff that's there up and out we're going to have to cough and get it out we're going to have to expectorate it um, and so what we want to do is we want to get our patients to inhale deeply so i love incentive spirometry if you have it great you can use it an in incentive spirometer you know you get it we put it in the mouth and you um, suck in like a thick milkshake i always say in and it'll expand out the lungs so what that does is that's opening the alveoli right we're going to try to pop open the alveoli as big as possible you know five to ten times and then once we're done we want to cough to bring that stuff up and out if you don't have that you're at home you're diagnosed or anyway i mean five to ten deep breaths you want to do that every hour and then I always say every commercial break that comes on the TV, if you still get commercials. Now, if you're like me, you don't get commercials anymore, hardly. So, um, you know, just every 15 minutes, maybe do a few big deep breaths, five to 10 if possible, and then cough. That's the ticket. Get that stuff up. And then you want to keep moving it up and spitting it out, getting it out, coughing it up and out. That's what we want to do. Um, this is going to help with clearing that and it will help with our gas exchange and that's going to help improve or increase our oxygenation so that's important um, control elevated temperature we can give an antipyretic we can tell them to take tylenol or acetaminophen ibuprofen is an inset if they're able to take it some patients can't um, it can also help with fever if needed um, and so we want to make sure that we get the fever down now here's the next thing sometimes a low-grade fever is a good thing right because what do we know about our body if we run a fever we're trying to kill something right but we don't need to have the super high fever we can take an antipyretic and let let the fever come back if it comes back if we're still processing and going through this journey of pneumonia um also, um, cloths, you can take damp cloths, put around the neck, you can put them over the head. That, I, people love it. I know nausea and vomiting, those patients that are nauseous and are thrown up, they love a good cloth. And I will tell you, when I'm sick with a fever or vomiting or anything like that, or just a headache or whatever, I like a cloth across my neck. I put one on my neck like that. It just feels good and it helps. Um, maintain nutritional fluid intake. We want to increase fluids if we can. Now, not all patients can have, can have an increase in fluid. And the reason behind that is if they have a cardiac history or some reason, kidney damage, and they're unable to um, handle extra fluid. But the reason why is we want to increase fluid so that we can thin secretions and be able to move things. That helps. It, it helps the body. Also, we have dehydration due to fever. Do you see how we're pulling stuff in? So if we're running a fever, it's possible that we could become dehydrated if we're not taking in enough fluid. So always enough fluid or more, increase your fluids to thin your secretions. Um, also, we need to eat because it takes energy to heal, number one. We need to eat. So um, making sure that they get things they can eat that will help. You know, a lot of people like soups, but stay away from the milk products, dairy products. Those will thicken secretions. So always kind of remember, let's stay towards clear liquids if possible. And that would be, you know, um, drinking water, Sprite, Gatorade, whatever they can get down. I mean, when you're sick, you want to get stuff in. Um, I do great with water when I'm well, but if I'm sick, I don't really want water. I want a little Gatorade and a little 7-Up. Um, Provide adequate rest. The body needs to rest. It has to to heal. So we need to allow rest. Now, one of the things that happens is we can have coughing, especially at night if we lay down. Secretions cause more issues. So we want to make sure that um, we prop up our patients, 
you know, have them sit up. We want them 30 or 40 degrees above. Um, if they ha are ventilated on a ventilator, they definitely need to be greater than 30 degrees so that we do not aspirate, which can cause hospital acquired pneumonia. We need to be very careful with that. Um, but getting the patient kind of propped where that can help with coughing, they feel like they can breathe. The whole thing about sitting up, there's a big thing with it, guys. If anybody's ever laid flat in the bed and you just really can't breathe, then you understand. Sit up, diaphragm drops, the rib cage is able um, to expand better. Um, if you're a heavier set person, it helps that volume that belly drop a little bit so that we get better expansion. And then on top of that, we're able to breathe deeper, move air, get air up. And then we want to suck on a lozenge if that will help with the throat, with, with um, coughing situation and comfort. Um, provide good oral hygiene. We need to make sure that we have girl, good oral hygiene. This is for those who are in the hospital. And if they're at home, they need to continue with oral hygiene too. It's good just to rinse that mouth and wash that mouth. We wanna make sure in the hospital we're doing, um, and we're going to use um, a product with, the girl, the, with oral hygiene that is provided by the hospital. And it usually has a peroxide type kind of mix in it, and you put it in and it's gonna kill all the germs because what happens is when we get mucus and stuff or we get things, we can create, the bacteria in the mouth can cause more issue and we can end up with a bacterial um, pneumonia. So especially if they're intubated, that's intubated. But if we're not intubated and we're just people, we still need good oral care. Um, smoking needs to stop. Inhalation of secondary smoke needs to stop. It's not gonna help. Any other irritant, if they're in a chemical, they work in a chemical plant, you know, they need to not be inhaling anything that's gonna irritate the lungs more or cause more damage. Um, and then avoid any other secondary bacterial infections that are in there. We don't need anything else to compromise the body. It's fighting for what everything it has to try to live. So that's just a quick little thing. For my students, go to 298. It's right there, kind of read through the treatment of pneumonias and different things. It will help. Um, there is alternative therapy, and I really appreciate Elsevier doing this now. Um, they're bringing this to the forefront because not everything needs a pill thrown at it, right? I, I'm a big advocate for that. Um, barberry root bark is used against bacteria, fungi, and viruses as well as other, as other organisms and is an alternative treatment for pneumonia. Now, I can be very honest with you, I've never used it, so I'm not really familiar or know, but I wanted to bring it to your attention because one of the things that's very important to know, if you come down here to this bottom line, it says it should not be used during pregnancy because it can cause spontaneous abortion. So I will tell you, if you have a patient that uses alternative therapy for medicine, they need to be very, very careful and understand what it does and what it affects. So you can't just take it because someone says this is going to help you and because it, it can cause different things to happen if you're pregnant for this spontaneous abortion. Excuse me, and we don't want that. Um, it does have an antimicrobial action against both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, and that's pretty impressive. I will be honest with you, after doing this little video today, I will be looking at barberry root um, and see a little more about it. Well, as nursing students, nurses, and people out in the community, influenza needs to be always learned and discussed. We see it discussed. We see it every year as nurses. We get our um, flu shot every year, and um, there's a lot to it. So let's get started on this. It's an acute, highly infectious disease of the upper and lower respiratory tracts. Um, it's seasonal. There is seasonal, but there's actually four types of influenza. Um, a and B are what we get vaccinated for, either A or B. And what they do is they try to figure out, and it's way beyond me, but they look at all of this to try to figure out which one will we probably have, which strain, and then we're vaccinated accordingly. And then C is a very mild case. Um, I just I just saw that and let me just share it with you because I'm not familiar with C. It's a mild respiratory illness that does not cause epidemics. And then D is what affects cattle. 
just so you know. So there's four kinds, even though it says three there, A, B, C. And the only reason why they're saying that three types is because that's for humans. And then D is for cattle. And then there's numerous subtypes. So there's variants and they, it, if we didn't learn anything from COVID is how viruses work. So they mutate and change and alter. And for influenza, it is one of those that does it every year. Um, it is spread by direct or indirect contact, contact just so you know. Um, it appears two to three days after the exposure, and we can start to have headache, fever, which is usually greater than 101 um, to about 103. So it's enough to be high enough to make you feel like crud, right? We can have chills and muscle aches. We can have sore throat, hacking cough, runny nose, and nasal congestion. Um, back to this, I do want to say, it makes it sound so simple. And some people get the flu and they, they go through it pretty quickly. They have these symptoms, but it doesn't last very long. Some people can get the flu and it can knock them flat for two weeks, a week to two weeks. Um, I actually had flu one year and it caused the, my esophagus the inner lining of my esophagus to slough off. So I couldn't even swallow. That's how bad it was. I was like literally with towels. It was horrible and I was sick. Um, so it, and that's when I knew how bad the flu can be. Um, one thing I do wanna share is if you, if for um, those who know, it can cause epidemics and that's why we talk about it. But every year there are between nine and 45 million cases um, cause not all are confirmed. And we understand that. Um, seasonal flu, it can come, it's coughing and sneezing. It's transferred from contaminated hands to objects. It goes back to when I go in the grocery store, I always now get the little wipe, but I never did that before. I never did that before COVID, but now I wipe my little thing and I, this stuff's probably so bad for you, but I kind of wipe my hands and then put it in the trash and move on. So there are things, we do have that, that hacking cough comes with the flu, just so you know, and we have all this congestion. So I just wanted to come back and just say, I just looked up really quickly about Rice syndrome and aspirin. We do not want to give aspirin to any child. And I'm now reading, it used to be 12, but now they're saying anybody's uh, under the age of 16 or under. And I actually just read something else that said, really they're recommending 19 or under not to take aspirin. So I find that very interesting because it can cause that. So this actual slide I'm pulling out a leafer. Um, that's a book that we use. It's um, back to tonsillitis. It's infection and inflammation of the tonsils. We have the high fever, sore throat, general malaise. Um, they can have referred pain to the ears. They can chill. Um, the tonsils can be red and swollen. Um, they could have yellow pocket, you know, yellow exudate hanging back there. Um, they are going to have an elevated white blood cell count. In any infection, we look for that. Just remember that we're looking in labs at an elevated WBC. Um, treatment, throat culture, um, and then possible surgery if we need to do a tonsillectomy or an adenectomy. Um, nursing management, we always think pre and post-op. So pre-op, we would keep them in PO before going for their um, surgery, 24 hours, um, usually after, before, after midnight, nothing by mouth till after surgery. When they come out, we do cool, clear, um, when they're able to tolerate it. Uh, we don't usually start anything post-op until they have bowel sounds and that we know that they're able to swallow. We need to be very careful, nothing really rough. We usually stick to soft, clear stuff and cool stuff. So this is a great picture that portrays what pink eye or conjunctivitis really looks like. And so conjunctivitis is the actual infection or inflammation of um, the conjunctiva, which is that lining of the eye, right? The mucosa of the eye. Um, they have edema, itching, crusting of eyelids, inflamed pink conjunctiva, as we can see, tearing and purulent, purulent drainage. So it can get really goopy and yucky. It's highly contagious, so we need to be very, very careful. So this, the conjunctivitis, it's the inflammation of the conjunctiva or mucous membrane that lines the eyelids. Um, 
it's caused by bacterial or viral organisms. It can't, or from a blocked lacrimal duct. So um, those are the re how we can get it. The acute form is commonly called pink eye, and that's what we know it as. Kids seem to get it, but I will tell you, we started to see it with COVID. We would have COVID pink eye, and there is something going around now, and I know for a fact, I've had a few students, and they've had pink eye, and one had COVID and one did not, so I don't know, but it's out there, which is kind of interesting. Um, we respond that it, the common forms respond to warm compresses, so always get a warm washcloth or something to put over the eyes. Also, if you have a lot of exudate that's dried on, you know, you want to soften, always wiping out and away. If it's one eye, always out and away. Um, we can use topical antibiotic eye drops or eye ointments to treat it. Um, the doctor will order those. We have the itching, the tearing of one or both eyes. You could have it in one, you try not to get it in the other, but you can have it in both eyes and it's easy to spread. Edema of the eyelids and periorbital tissues. Children's may, children may appear distracted or irritable. It doesn't feel good, it hurts, it burns. So we always wanna make sure that um, we understand that and we need to get it treated and that's how you treat it. Um, also, if you are a female that wears eye makeup and you get pink eye conjunctivitis, you need to throw all your eye makeup away um, because it would be consider, considered contaminated. Um, your mascara and liners, anything that gets around that, they need to go away, get it, I hate it, it's an expense, but you put it in the trash and go get new or you'll just be spreading it back and forth and have a lot of issues. Um, it goes back to washing of hands. Um, hang on once. Um, a couple things you need to know is uh, ointments will blur vision. So if I'm putting ointments in, um, just know I usually put them in at hours of rest, not during daytime hours if the, if the child's ambulatory. And same with adults. We need to understand that if we're using eye ointments, you know, it can cause visual disturbances based on putting something goopy in your eye and you can't see very well. So we need to be very careful and aware of that. But one of the things is, is that we try not to use it during daytime hours um, if they are um, ambulatory. It's considered no longer contagious pink eye if they have been treated for 24 hours. After 24 hours, it's a, with appropriate antimicrobial therapy, it is no longer considered contagious. Now, that for all those who have children in daycare and things like that, schools, stuff like that, you have to go by what their protocol is. But just so you know, if they've been receiving an antimicrobial ointment or drop for 24 hours for the for pink eye conjunctivitis, they after 24 hours, they're not considered um, contagious anymore. Um, also too, teaching how to wipe secretions from the eyes. You don't wanna wipe inward. We wanna uh, wipe from the inner canthus down and out and back and always away from the um, ineffected eye. So if this is my affected eye, I don't wanna wipe towards the other eye because all I'm doing is spreading infection towards, right? So I'll wipe away from, down and away and out. Um, we also wanna make sure that we wash our hands. It just goes back to that again, wash your hands, wash your hands. And also understanding we don't need to be sharing washcloths with children or anybody with pink eye. If I had pink eye and I have people in my home that live with me, um, you know, I don't need to be washing with, and then they wash with the same washcloth or they use the washcloth to wipe on their hands or something for whatever reason. But we need to make sure we're very aware and alert of tissues going in the trash, people not handling things because that's how we spread it and we just don't want to. So I made this little slide to help bring it all together with the conjunctivitis. Pink eye is no longer considered contagious after 24 hours of appropriate antimicrobial therapy. 
Um, warm compressors and topical antibiotic ailments are used to care for clients. That's what we do. And it can also be an ointment or a drop, but normally we see an ointment with it. Um, eye ointments blur vision, so don't give during the daytime hours for ambulatory children because they're going to not be able to see. We need to remember that. Now, if they have to have it in the day and they have to have it at night, so let's say twice a day or three times a day, they're going to have to get it during that time frame. But just kind of think about it. You know, it's not the time that they're getting ready to go walk out the door to go do something. So we want to make sure that we kind of plan it. Um, white from the inner canthus downward and away from the opposite eye to prevent spreading of the infection. So I just said all of that on the slide prior, and now I have a slide that just reinforces it. And it goes back to wash your hands and teach the clients to wash theirs. It's absolutely appalling to me that I have to say wash your hands, but I'm going to go on record to say it. Wash your hands with soap and water and teach the clients to wash theirs. If we didn't learn anything from the pandemic, we should have learned that. But what it showed me is that we don't wash our hands like we should after during the pandemic. So um, wash your hands and teach your clients to wash theirs. Also, for my students on page 596 in your medical surgical book, review eye drops and eye ointments. You need to know how to put an eye drop in and you need to know how to um, use an eye ointment. Go back and refresh yourself on that because you hold it so high, you put it, you know, the whole thing. Go through that so that when you go into the clinical setting, you're able to um, do that without any issues. So this kind of wraps it up. I hope this helps. Um, for my students, go back into your reading. You had an activity on Monday where there were a lot of questions that were given to you with answers. Start to plug that all together and you have all the information you should have if you do the assigned readings. I hope it helps.